Today we are talking with Sandra, Adam, and Stephen, the creative team responsible for the restoration and archiving of Houston's Apollo Mission Control Center. The Apollo mission was charged with carrying out President Kennedy's ambition to land the first person on the moon and safely return them back to Earth. Upon clearing the launch pad tower, control and communication was transferred to Houston's Apollo Mission Control Center. We will learn about the Control Center's history and its importance to humanity and the space program, along with the tenacity and commitment it took to restore this treasure and important historic landmark. It is my hope that after this episode, you will be inspired to visit Space Center Houston and sit in the actual Apollo Mission Control Center and be transported back in time to experience the moment the U.S. landed a person on the moon. Thank you so much for having me here. I am uh, super honored and super excited to be here. Um, Of course, as you know or may not know, um, I grew up here in the... uh, the Houston area. Uh, one of my claims to fame was I actually mowed the lawn for Sally Ride, so that oh, was a nice. lot of fun. Hey. So wow, cool. interesting factoid. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, she's no longer with us, but uh, she was, uh, yeah, right uh, the street over, and so that was a big honor at the time. And certainly, living in Space City, space City. Um, has mm-hmm. definitely been a, a blessing, and uh, we've seen a lot of beautiful things go by. And uh, when I attended recently to see the tours and all of that good stuff, I got the opportunity to see what uh, the three of you. Have have been uh, excitedly working on, and uh, that's what we're here to talk about, the Apollo Mission Control Center. And uh, I guess... Yeah, we hope you enjoyed it. Oh, it was beautiful. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, And, uh, yeah, to see the visceralness of the actuality of it, I think, is is wonderful. So, if you could um, introduce yourself and then kind of tell us a little bit about uh, what the Apollo Mission Control is. Okay, so I'm Sandra Tetley. I am the JSC Historic Preservation Officer and Real Property Officer. So um, in 2013, um, as I'm over all the historic areas of the center and the historic buildings. And so um, in 2013, the uh, National Park Service, they have grants for National Historic Landmarks. And so I applied for one because the Apollo Mission Control had been basically left, just open and left, and they just left it alone. And you could go in there and walk into the room and sit at the consoles. And if you're an intern, you could have coffee and, you know, your banana or whatever. And so I applied to have a little video, historic video made and produced for visitors. So the National Park Service was very interested and the uh, director of of our region uh, came down and then they said, we really think you should do more. We want to uh, offer you money to do a historic furnishings report and then we would like to help you pursue restoring it. And so that's how it kind of came about. And that was in 2013. 2013. And, 2013. and it just recently got completed formally, and that's it, 10 years? Uh, it, well, it was finished in 2019 for the 50th anniversary, and then we had some final details after that. So it was substantially complete for the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. Okay. And why is Apollo Mission Control so important to humanity, but also to the NASA story? Well, landing on the moon, that was, you know, uh, never before done. It really changed the the world. It changed um, everything from, you know, technology as technology changed. It um, it sort of was the culmination of the Cold War. Um, that was a big, big deal. We beat the Russians to the moon. And um, it was a, a very unifying point as well. And that was one of the reasons why we put that speech from Nixon in the the vid- visitor experience is because, you know, they landed on the moon and now everyone was one. We were all focused and unified for them. So it was, uh, it, it changed the world for sure. Hello, Neil and Buzz. I'm talking to you by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. And this certainly has to be the most historic telephone call ever made from the White House. I just can't tell you how proud we all are of what you have done. And keeping that restoration in a world that uh, seems to be moving more and more oh. digital to, to actually have the visceral, you know, in real life, tactile, the actual servers and machines. I mean, that's got to be a, a beautiful thing for you all to it see. Is, yeah, the, the way I look at it, it, you know, I've got a, a long archaeological background. Um, you know, I've studied people all over the world. Uh, the big events that happen in, in humanity as far as our social evolution and technological evolution and all that. Um, you know, 
going to another planetary body and back is, you know, was that big, you know, really next step, you know, in our evolution, you know, we, we brought the, the, the stars home to our, you know, our, our earth. So it's, you know, that's kind of how I see it. And yeah, and how extraordinary that that was controlled from, from a room in, you know, room in Houston. Right, um, and I and think I think that I uh, heard someone say that the compute power that's in that room and the surrounding servers is is less than our iPhones. You have more computing power in your iPhone than the entire building had. The Where entire building, not yeah. just that particular mm-hmm. server. Right, room. right. It's largely just electrical. The consoles aren't computers. They're they're just desks that you know showed images and and had you know communication buttons and things like that. So yeah, it kind of makes you question sometimes our focus on technology and the fact that we have all that power and then there it was how many people sat in the control center at the, mm-hmm. during the mission i mean how many people would be in the in about, the room about, well there was co- about 20 consoles so 20 consoles yeah and then, so but then they all had you know there was people milling during around during shift change yeah. and right that kind of thing <laughs> but but yeah i think that we sometimes forget about uh, human power i guess is what i'm trying to get oh. to especially mm-hmm. when we're now mm-hmm. Dealing with uh, the chat GPTs, and you yes. know, we're looking for other things to give us answers. And here it was: these, uh, you know, this crew and the people up in in space were were humans doing great things. And right. I think we yes. forget right. that sometimes. Yeah, they had to do it all by hand. Mm-hmm. Uh, the men in the mission control room, you know, in in a sense, they had computing power in back rooms. You know, people doing the math for them. Right. Uh, all the support staff that that led into the, you know, that were separate teams. Um, you know. The guys at the consoles were the leader of the team, right. and you know if they had a question, they'd kick it back to the back rooms, and they would solve the problem and, and give them the answer back. A yeah, very good good example of that's during the Apollo Eleven descent, which is which we feature in the restoration, and there was a series of program alarms called twelve oh one and twelve oh two alarms, and on the spacecraft and. Uh, Neil Armstrong radioed those to the ground and it was the guidance officer, Steve Bales, went to his back room and said, you know, what's that alarm? And within 15 seconds had an answer. Wow. Um, to yeah. continue the, do we continue the landing or not? Is this go or no go? You know. So, um, and yeah, I mean, this it would take you more than 15 seconds to input all of that and get right. the 15 data. Seconds, <laughs> 15 seconds was considered a long time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. that sounds super quick to me. It's like, wow, good. Luck. <laughs> I think that... Uh, the thing that I also realized with the space program is is the humanity of it, that it, it is um, getting these crew members up into space, but then also getting them back home safely and the burden that that uh, must have been like. And uh, that's something that you definitely bring back with the restoration to bring back that palpability again of, you know, I mean, even when you're listening, uh, part of the restoration, the video is you're listening to that landing and, and you're you're feeling it. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what we wanted to, for you to for you to experience. Not just what you know that they saw on TV, because you only saw a portion of it on TV or everybody who was watching it. But when you're in there hearing that, and you're hearing the decisions being made, you know, boom, 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 and these men having to to look at their data and make a decision and and all of that, and then where where we were going to land was a crater and so they had to fly it and the fuel kept cutting down you know going down till we landed with 17 seconds of fuel we wanted that emotion oh, oh we wanted all of that to show that it's not easy and it is it's a a difficult task and and you have to be really focused on it so we wanted that for sure as, as Sandra mm-hmm. says you, you you wouldn't know that from seeing on the TV you're just hearing the, the air-to-ground audio, but we had 11,000 hours of, of the, the, the loop audio from the controllers, and we had that to work with during that landing sequence. So we were oh, selecting right. which channels are we going to have that that will portray what was you know best going on in the room to the people who, who were in the viewing gallery. Yeah, and that's a good segue into uh, your particular uh, role with the film, um, with the uh, restoration was gathering and editing and compiling and deciding on the video. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, partly uh, making the films for the visitor experience. So when you're in there and, and uh, we have Gene Krantz doing the doing the introduction and the voiceover, and there are little interstitials between the um, between the scenes. So um, we have the landing, we have the moonwalk, we have the plaque reading, we have the call to pre- the presidential call to Nixon, and the landing on the carrier. And in between those, he gives a little fills in with a little bit of background. Um, so that, that it, there's the multimedia experience of that. But then also before all that, um, basically looking at all the film that was shot on the day. 
and the video and working out what was on the screens because we have no we have no computer records, no. do we, of what no. of what was on the right. screens. The only way we could do it was by you know, there were there were cameramen filming in the control room and because I worked on I've worked on a lot of documentaries to do with the space program, including Apollo Eleven, um, which was a feature length doc documentary which we released in two thousand and nineteen. And we basically organized all this material um, into the correct days, the correct timeline, and so we knew when every bit of footage shot in Mission Control was filmed. And obviously, sometimes the cameramen film the screen, and so then we can use that information and extrapolate that and recreate the so everything. All the screens move exactly as they did at the time. Well, I hope they do. I think they do. <laughs> we do. We spent a lot of like time. Did, yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and the clocks move, and the uh, it's all oh, got wow, to be historically know, accurate. So. Yeah, we didn't have anything. Well, tell them that whole story about having to recreate all of that. Yeah, we really did. Um, we had, you know, obviously the the film and and uh, <clears throat> some stills and things like that to go off of. But you know, in a in a dark room with with bright screens, you know, oftentimes what was displayed was white, so you really just total washout in what you're looking at. So you know, piecing piecing together what really needed to, we needed to show, you know, to be a hundred percent accurate to that minute. Um, you know that was that was really difficult. It took a really long time. Yes, yeah, Herculean effort. And even the feed, sure. the television feed of Neil Armstrong setting foot on the moon, we had to make sure that that looked exactly as it did to the controllers. And we could fill, probably fill another podcast with all the subtleties <laughs> of how that image came back to Earth. But the, what was seen in Houston um, was different to what was seen in Australia. And so, for example, even though the pictures came through Australia, and so we had to make that feed look exactly as it did to the controllers and that that meant things like well we have a tape recording of it so we have to if there's any glitches that are on the tape we have to remove those because we look it's a live feed they were looking at a live feed so yeah, yeah little, yeah, yeah. Lots, little, things, little, little things, things like, like that the consoles mm. too um you know we replaced the mm. the old monitors that were in them and and they're just flat screen monitors now mm. but some of the what we did with the imagery that's on though we round the edges to make it look oh, nice. you know more yeah. like a crt Mm -hmm. And even the Mr. Hands, who's up on the screen when he's moving the astronauts and documenting, we that there was that was real time, and so we actually had to go over and film that in Building Two, and oh, we wow. had a guy have the hands, and we did it according to the the um, you know, the the words that we had and what was going on and the the whole. Uh, timing and everything so we recreated all that to make it historically accurate so it's a digital recreation of what's an analog so to, to, we have to make the digital <laughs> look like analog and so it's like you wouldn't know the put some noise on it yeah. right. you wouldn't know right. Tyler yeah. Strahl did a lot of the, yeah, the to... artistry and drawing of those the lunar maps and uh, making the clocks above the big screens look just right mm. um, wow. just an excellent job yeah so yeah I can imagine like um, did you expect it to take um, I guess you said it was 2019. Did you expect it to take six years? Is that faster, shorter? So, yeah. <laughs> we really. put, a, put a man on the moon quicker. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, we have we have an email from Mr. Kranz saying that it, it took us longer to uh, design and fly Apollo 8 than this is taking. So, you know, there was one step. But we, a lot of it, we went back and, and looked at the timing, and it was four years of just planning and getting funding and and a lot of political battles of how it was going to be restored and who was going to lead that that effort. And so for about four years, it was really literally a political battle wow. until we finally won. I'll say we won. And um, so then it took, we only really had about 18 to 20 months to actually get it completely ready for the 50th anniversary. And that was you know, yeah, it a Herculean like effort. Yeah, yeah, it did. It felt like four. I mean, but it was, a, and we... You didn't see much daylight, did you, Adam? No. <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> and even, you know, then. we took yeah. all of the seating out of the viewing room. So all those seats were shipped up to the lady that restored them in Plano, and its original fabric. Oh, and coming wow. from Houston, I don't know if you recognize, but that color pattern is what the Astros are based off of. Oh, the did orange, not know The that. orange and the red seating, and the okay. Astrodome had that color combination. Oh, sure, yeah. So that carpet it is original and then all the seats were original and then we ended up having to take well we took all the consoles out and took them shipped them to Cosmosphere who restored them and we just we had to strip it all down and then we built it all back up wow yeah. 
So in that process, you're obviously the team lead. I guess if we can kind of correlate some of, again, what Apollo did to get them in the moon, how did you gather your team? How did you, you know, get them excited? I would imagine there was some ebb and flow of like, oh, my gosh, this is going to be great. Oh, my gosh, this is going to be awful. Right. Oh, my gosh, are we going to get it right? Oh, do we need to cut the corners? Maybe we don't need the seats. I mean, those oh, are tough decisions. Very tough. Um, yeah, one of the biggest battles was, you know, since Space Center Houston is the one that brings people tour um, guests through is they wanted more of a kind of a Disney-esque experience, mm -hmm. you know, where where you, we had uh, descriptive and animations on the screens and so forth. And, and that was not historically accurate. So that was our biggest first battle is to, to determine that it was going to be historically accurate. And the flight controllers really were instrumental in helping guide that historic preservation, you know, historical accuracy. And fortunately for me, I had Adam on contract for historic preservation support. And he was the one who really put together the team to do the nuts and the bolts while I was sort of dealing with the the money and the the political battles. So he can tell you about that team and how that was put together. Right, yeah, that wasn't an easy task. Um, I'd done a number of preservation projects around Texas, but none that included, you know, a combination of, you know, technology and metals and carpet and wood and, you know, wallpaper and all these things. So. I really had to reach out to historic societies around Texas, San Antonio, Houston, Dallas area, just to see, um, you know, my focus was really who had who'd done some work on some of the really, really nice, beautiful, historic um, courthouses around Texas, because that, that was kind of the closest. Yeah, that is. Yeah, I've heard a lot of restoration in yeah. one of those, yeah. Yeah, so, so I was able to get some names and reach out to folks and, and start talking to them and, and finally got with uh, Stern and Buchek here in Houston who uh, kind of led that part of the process with the carpets and the wallpaper and, and things like that. And the consoles was a different beast. Um, <laughs> who could restore the consoles? And I just had this idea one day that I would look, look at the Apollo 13 movie and go through the credits and find, you know, an art production designer oh, yeah. nice. and find that name and, and reach out to him and see if I could find him. And, and I did. I got, I got lucky. I found him on Facebook and sent a message and, Next day, he, he got back to me and said, oh, yeah, you know, this is so great that you're doing this. I can't believe it's been, what do you say, 10, 20 years, you know, since the movie. And, you know, here's, here's who we kind of talked with and consulted with and who restored the consoles for our movie. Oh, and that wonderful. was the, the Cosmosphere in Kansas. So that was really the primary parts of the team. Uh, that's exciting. So we have you three to thank then. The Tinkerbell's not sliding down along the uh, yes, the yes, landing yes. line that's otherwise. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's Mickey awesome. Mouse isn't on the screen yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Hey. So, no, that's great. So uh, talk about tenacity and, and persistence to kind of get something like this, you know, uh, completed again to the, you know, again, it doesn't sound like it was, you know, an easy feat. Uh, and I guess I'm just... Uh, trying to get to the fact of what your kind of personal creative process, I guess, is of, you know, again, because, you know, where do I go for the, the computers? Oh, I'll go to the, the credits or something. So it's just kind of the... So, it, yeah, you talk about tenacity. It really was because we had... So flight operations are the ones who run mission control. You know, they are the ones that actually man mission control. You know, they're doing the space station and so forth. So that's kind of their building, and that's really their hallowed ground. The flight, they say mission control is, that's their cathedral, especially for the Apollo. So most of the Apollo flight controllers have retired, and so they have the new generation shuttle and so forth. And so we had to... Um, work with them because they wanted kind of to control it. And then external relations, because they knew people would come see it. We had to deal with them. And then Space Center Houston. And then we had the whole money part, who was going to pay for it. <clears throat> so finally, um, the city of Webster stepped up and, and donated $3.5 million oh, wow. with a matching 500000 if Space Center Houston ran a Kickstarter campaign. And so that became the bulk of the money. And then uh, JSC itself put in $2 million. But the the issue with the money was we didn't even get it up front. We got it in chunks like every six months. So we had this massive project to do that we were still trying to understand what we were dealing with, you know, what was historically accurate, what was real, what was not real, really? what was in the Apollo configuration. And then we had to break that into chunks of what we could do with this amount of money 
and then have it all ready by the 20, 2019, by the 50th anniversary. And so it was it was a literally a constant battle. It really and, was. Yeah. Total, then, total, you know, speaking of tenacious. I mean, you can't this, get is, more this, is, this yeah. is Mrs. <laughs> tenacious. But yeah, the money, the ownership, the, you know. Then you the, get, accuracy. the accuracy. That was our biggest battle, literally. Once we finally got to start work, um, yes. you know, do we keep this wallpaper? Do we not? Do we you know, restore things, do we clean it and leave it, you know, looking used, you know, um, there's uh, nicotine staining on the on the ceiling tracks, you know, do we replace all those or do we leave that? And, you know, all these conversations took place among us and the experts that were involved in the project uh, under us. So, mm-hmm. you know, this it was, it was an everyday thing, mm-hmm. especially as we're tearing down the project and building it back up. And it's a National Historic Landmark. So we not only have all these, you know, kind of these stakeholders here at the center, but we also are dealing with the Texas Historic Commission, the SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Officer, and the National Park Service. And so, and then also we, to further complicate it, in order for us to get the donations, we're the first federal agency to use the provision in the National Historic Preservation Act where donations could go to the advisory council and then they provide it to the federal agency um, for the specific project. So they're now involved. And so they're an oversight, you know, governmental oversight committee. So there are all these players and, you know, everyone has opinions. And so it was, um, yeah, So you're just on fun. the phone every day, just uh, preservation, go, no, go. Yeah, go, are no. We, uh, no, go for 20,000 on nicotine? Honestly, what we, what we, I think, and I don't know, maybe, I, I don't know if I should say this or not, but basically what we ended up doing is that, our team knew it needed to be historically accurate. And the flight controllers agreed with that. And just from the standpoint of history. So we took a lot of information, but we did what was right. Right. And so. that was the guiding vision. Um, she kept the wolves at bay mm-hmm. and the rest of us got to work. And what's, yeah. what's great about the, the, the footage and the archive from the room is once we once we have it in the right timeline and we, we have it all, we know when it was filmed, it, it can't be wrong. Like we know right. it is this is what it looked like. Wow. This is what was on this clock. So if someone wants to kind of go against that, then we sort of know otherwise. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, right. We have the truth, basically. Right. So, and even using all that film, because he had he had film that we'd never seen before, especially of the room. So we had to go, this one went through every piece of film and every still photograph they could find to determine where was that pin Wow. Where was that ashtray? Where was oh that? What gosh. did that cup look like? What document was out there? What buttons were lit up? What was flashing? So all of that, every console, that was his. That was his job to make sure that was all accurate. Yeah, because we 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 had everything scanned into two K resolution or, or higher. Um, that meant that we could resolve a lot more than a lot of stuff out there before had just been you know in sort of beta vhs dubs that have gone right. back about 10 generations and <laughs> you, you couldn't make things out so yeah it was useful having that i think mm-hmm. yeah. yeah so i can imagine at the end of this um describe the feeling i mean um because i know as a creative um usually and it sounds like maybe in this case the 50th anniversary was your drop dead deadline because I mean usually you can be like well I could tweak that I could tweak that so how did you tell yourself that it was done? Uh, well, for the 50th anniversary, we had um, two two grand openings. We had kind of one for you know the the workers and that it would have um, the flight controllers and you know kind of family kind of thing. And then one was bigger with, with the NASA administrator, congressmen, senators, you know, all that. So so we knew that that date we needed to have it you know, so that when people walk through, it would look complete. We, and we knew there were some things that weren't completely, you know, we weren't finished with some things, right. documents mainly, I guess. But um, to me, the biggest reward I got is when a flight controller who worked in that room came in and he got tears in his eyes because oh, wow. he felt like he was walking back 50 years. And then when they saw the visitor experience and many of them cried, we knew that we had succeeded. So, and that's all. You know, anyone else, all the awards that we won and all that, that did not compare to what, to having that feeling from them. Yeah, that was the guiding Most definitely the the emotion that these guys exhibited when they went back to their old workplace. And it 
it was what it was, you know, that was that was the best feeling for yeah. sure. And, and and many of them brought their wives for the for the grand opening. They got to bring their wives, and their wives had never been on the floor ever. Wow, you know, family was not allowed, especially wives. And so it was really meaningful for them to bring them down to say, this is, you know, this is where I did. And some of them were going, well, you, did you give them this cup? You know, did you give them a cup? That kind of thing. So <laughs> that was really, it was really neat. Yeah, to me, yeah. it's not quite complete. There's still some areas where we couldn't quite figure out what that map was or what that document was. The, the imagery just wasn't good enough. And it's still, so we, I have a list, you know, we, we know what's, <laughs> yeah. what we'd like to get in there to finish it off. Yeah. So what are some Easter eggs, if you can share those that are, when we look out and you're like, oh, I know that or something. The first thing I think of is the wallpaper. There's some original wallpaper in there that we were able to find. You know, when, when something was removed, it's like, oh, there's, <clears throat> this is in great condition. And, and uh, you know, I like it because we did such a good job replicating it. And, you know, so it's, it's just... So tell like, them that story how we found that wallpaper, the original wallpaper. One, the, the original wallpaper. The uh, fire extinguisher. Uh-huh, well, you fire. were there for that, so you should. Probably okay, so that story. so <laughs> between the Apollo program and the shuttle program, they had recarpeted and rewallpapered the whole room. So for some reason, one day. Um, a fire tech had removed a fire extinguisher off the wall. And so our finishes guy, Yanni Langer, he was going, look at this. He said, that's original wallpaper. And he could, I don't know, he's got some scope. He looks and he said, that's the original wallpaper. So we went back and on the original drawings, we found the company who had had created this wallpaper and we went to them and they had been purchased. So we went to that company and they went in their warehouse and found the roller and what? so, yeah, and so Adam worked with them to make sure that the, um, you know, it had the pattern. The roller was had been cleaned, and so it was a little bit crisper, but we worked on the color. We got the color right, and then they reprinted all the wallpaper. And the wallpaper that we knew was original behind certain things, like a, um, a electrical panel, we just left it. And then so we know that that's in there. So, yeah. I cool. really like the delineation between what's on the main mission control screen and in the viewing room screen. So, for example, when the alarm song is going down, it has the live from the moon um, graphic is on the one in the viewing gallery, and obviously it's not on the main, you know. And so it's, I love that, well, I, it's kind of quite sad that I went to all that <laughs> trouble to make it look... <laughs> Um, but hey, that's that, historic. Well, that was, that you know, was a CBS. That is what you get yeah, the CBS like, had the animation that was, you know, coming down. Yeah. in when he's doing that, you know, yeah. he's doing yeah. that stuff. And um, <laughs> uh, there was a lot of conversations about what they could have, what channels they could have had access yeah. to, you know. Yeah. Right. Another little nugget is um, <laughs> in the large screen that's right up front, the command module is is moving along that line um, in and out of contact with with oh, wow. you know, okay. loss of contact. Yeah, we made it. Uh, and you, it may not be something that you, when you're in there watching it, but it turns color, right? If it's within radio contact emission control, it's a certain color. And when it's beyond um, contact, it's turned a different color. And so we actually had that, yeah. that done, but That's too. all yeah. done by Tyler, the an- yes, animator. the animator. Looking at the mm-hmm. f- film you know, and, and, and <laughs> replicating it. Yeah, yeah, we didn't. It's all been created from scratch, hasn't it, basic one? Well, yeah, he created it all from, yeah, he, yeah, drew, it all. he yeah. drew it all. It's incredible. Yes. Yeah. The glass slides no longer exist that used to run behind the, in the back cave behind mm-hmm. the screens. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, he had to redraw it all from imagery. Oh, wow. And, and you know, I think it's, you, you don't really know when you're there, but these these them and Tyler and then Ben Feist, who's kind of an audio expert, or well, he is the audio expert, they had to make sure that when it said this time, these things were on the screen and were mm-hmm. on the consoles. And when it flipped to this, these things were on the consoles and the screens. And that was minute by minute, mission by mission. And then that all had to be synced up with the audio. So it's all, you know, as if you were reliving that. Acts. I mean, yes, yeah. for five yeah. different acts. Another, another thing is that there was, a, there was a camera in the corner of the control room that had like a, basically a locked off view of the control room during the descent and also before the first steps. Um, and NASA doesn't have a copy of that footage. Oh, um, no. So this was out, this was going out to the, the world and so that if CBS wanted to cut to that, then they could, but they st- stayed on their animations for the, for the descent. So wow. actually it was um, from a broadcaster in Europe had recorded, happened to have recorded, kept a recording of that feed. Wow. And so, and that, and that shows exactly the screens changing all the way through the descent. 
Um, obviously, it's 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 not as clear as that. And, and, and there's also a film cameraman on the floor. Right. But what he's just shooting in very short bursts. It's mm-hmm. like I mean, to my kind of frustration, he was just <laughs> camera on, camera off, cam- camera on, camera off. Well, they had to yeah preserve film. They didn't couldn't just go all night with the, back <laughs> well, in film's the expensive. Well, yeah, yeah, back in the day, so NASA, yeah. yeah, can spend all that money on sending a man to the moon, but they can't. We didn't, we've got didn't film, film everything. That's right. That's right. Um, <laughs> wasn't, there, wasn't there like an urban legend, and maybe you can corroborate, that even some of the footage after the moon, they, they're just like, well, we'll just record over these VHSs. Like, why would anybody need that? It, it's, it's, it needs to be a whole other podcast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> All right. <laughs> to that, yeah. But they, they that, that footage of, I, I think what you're referring to is the, the, the black and white footage of, of the moonwalk. The original tapes for that don't exist anymore. Wow. And in fact, the, the, what, what we're using... Um, it was recorded in New York in, C- at CB- in CBS in the studio wow. um, because the original tapes were, well it, it's a copy it, it, anyway I'm not gonna yeah, yeah. don't get no, me I hear you in that. and I had kind of a, a neat uh, Easter egg just as a personal for me so we on the the, and you couldn't see it because you didn't go on the floor, but on the backs of the consoles are these large maps, and they're the moon landing maps and the uh, the world trajectory of everything. And so we had been looking for these maps, and um, my dad had worked at NASA. And so I remember cleaning out my mother's house during this period of time that there was um, a, he had a cylindrical girdle box, which what girdles used to go in, and it had Apollo 11, 13, and 15 written on it. So I said, I need to go see what's in there. And out of the six maps that we needed he had five of them oh and my so gosh. we were able to recreate those so that's that's kind of special to me that is to super that. special yeah, yeah you were yeah. the right person for the yeah. job on <laughs> it was, i guess so. another, like, uh, <laughs> very nice so now this is all preserved and i understand they have a new mission control now um do you have your preservation hat on for that one eventually being you know, needing to be restrained, or is it just kind of a whole mindset now? <laughs> no. Um, so, where did y'all go to um, the ISS flight control room that's right below Apollo? Okay. We so, that's, not, no. I don't know if that's on tour anymore, but that's where the International Space Station okay. is. Okay. So, when they, when they changed that out, um, there were, and, and then in 30 South, where the new Artemis mission control is, that's where they really, um, the main shuttle missions, that's where they had moved. So when they cleaned that out, could because technology kept upgrading, I kept three of those consoles because nice. there wasn't a preservation effort for shuttle at all, for shuttle mission control. So now what we're trying to do now is I'm working with the people in the flight operations to set up. A, an exhibit where you can kind of see how mission control has changed from uh-huh. the green static consoles to more of the computerized consoles to now it's real just server-based and it's very high-tech and, you know, um, lots of screens and they have a lot more information and they can do a lot more from their consoles. So we're looking at something like that. But Yeah, I think yeah. from a building management perspective, they probably couldn't dedicate yeah. another full room to right. a museum. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. We had to fight to keep yeah. Apollo. You know, they have, well, that's prime real estate. Well, too bad. <laughs> so now, and now, now that it's done, everyone loves it. Everyone here who, you know, is a waste of money, it's a waste of time, it's a waste of space. Now they all love it. So it was, it was worth the fight. Yeah. Again, uh, as somebody with kids, <clears throat> with the visceralness of, of actually seeing it and knowing that that's, you know, not plastic or anything like that, it's like, that's the real deal. And, and, uh, and even as, you know, again, having grown up in Houston, there's kind of been an ebb and flow with the space program. And yeah. certainly right now there's a resurgence with SpaceX and all of the great things that NASA is doing with the Artemis and everything like that, that uh, I think it's an exciting time for people to come down and, and check this out and, and to also just, yeah, a resurgence for looking you know, upward and and onward, I guess, as they say. Are you all three space fans, or I know restoration and video? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. When I actually saw Apollo thirteen at the the cinema as as an eight year old, that was (laughs) that was probably it for yeah. That did it for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, That's a it's an unreal movie for sure. And again, the the ingenuity of of uh, you know uh, not panicking. You know, there's a solution. We can't find it in 15 seconds, maybe, but we can keep finding it and right. searching it. Keep and, working on and it. And that kind of thing. Failure's so. not an option. There you yeah. go, mm-hmm. for sure. No. Which was never actually said, was it? It was <laughs> never actually, it was, it, it, it was. Oh, no, don't, don't ruin it, Stephen. Oh, it's no. okay. Yeah, <laughs> no, we're don't ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> also, so. it's Houston, we've had a problem, not Houston, we have a problem. Oh, the past Houston, tense. Indeed, yeah. Uh, see, that's the way, and you guys are keeping it all. 
actuality. There's no, That's right. no keeping uh, it real. Yeah, yep. and you get to sit in the <laughs> original real. seat and feel like a VIP at looking down at uh, Mission Control. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why I think it was great that the family members. Mm -hmm. Got to see. I mean, Mm -hmm. I'm sure, and that was kind of depicted in some of the movies as well. I mean, how difficult it must have been for a spouse to, you know, sit there and know that they can't do anything. You know, they don't know the ingenuity of the computers and they can't talk and say, you know, I love you or something like that. So it uh, must have been interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, yeah, there's a a whole uh, history in there. And the fact that you got the seats right. So... But, yeah, uh, when we were working on the viewing room, we have really interesting, uh, great photographs of the children yeah. who are sitting there at the very front, you know, right there at that front rail looking into mission control, you know, and they're like looking at, I guess they're, you know, they could be seeing their dad on the screen or whatever, but it's really cool that, and, you know, some of them are very pensive looks like, gosh, you know, is, is this going to go all right or whatever? So, yeah. Yeah, we had that. There's, there's some film of Neil Armstrong's son and... Um, arriving, mm-hmm. you, you know that film, yeah. Uh, actually, going into the viewing oh, gallery wow. during the final TV broadcast um, to Earth, and and we used that in the Apollo Eleven documentary. And actually, I was at the premiere, and I was actually sat next to him, and he was like, "Oh, it's me." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's quite cool. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, they they seem so far off, but you you bring them really close uh, with mm-hmm. this particular uh, restoration and everything that you're doing. So. Awesome. So what's next? What's uh, on the horizon, as they say? So, well, right now we are working on Building 37 was where the astronauts um, and the moon rocks were first came back. When they came back to Earth, they were quarantined in Building 37. And so that building is being demolished. And so we are uh, working on it as an interpretive park. So we're developing the interpretive park that when you go out there, you can still understand the importance of the building, what it was, and then we're saving the Radiation Counting Lab, which was 54 stories. Is that what it is? 50, I don't know. It's it's 54 feet or something underneath the ground. Oh, and wow. they yeah, and it eight has stories below the ground. eight yeah. stories. Okay. And so, and that's where they would take the astronauts and the rocks to count their um, radiation to see okay. how radioactive they were because there's no radiation in it at all. So we're saving that for posterity. It's maybe. built like a missile silo. It's, yeah, I can imagine. Little, yeah, it might be. Down there. Yeah, it's very creepy. <laughs> and so someday some archaeologists can still go down there and see it. It's very cool. But yeah. So we're doing that and then um, protecting some of our historic buildings. And the visitor's um, lobby in Building 30. Yes, yes, that's right. That's uh, right. Really dedicating mm-hmm. more of a space to the flight controllers that worked in the, yeah. in the building. So. Oh, wonderful. The okay. one y'all came in, when you first came to the tour, that lobby there, we're going to redo it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I could see you being able to use more stuff there and kind of, mm-hmm. yeah, present some more things. And so, yeah, to, again, help get that experience right. beginning and that kind of thing. So. Well, wonderful. Well, thanks for everything that you've done with yeah, the restoration. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, thank, thank you, you so much for your time. Thank you. And uh, yeah, appreciate it. And keep on, as they say, looking onward and upward. Uh, so. Onward and upward. <laughs> <laughs> thanks to my guests, Sandra Tetley, Adam Graves, and Stephen Slater for their time and for their dedication to their craft. Please visit Space Center Houston to tour Apollo Mission Control Center and other exhibits highlighting our space journey. If you like this episode and to hear others like it, please subscribe and share the show with others. The show 713 is produced and edited by Half Full Productions. See you next time.